morning to you. Welcome to Christ the King. Great to be with you this morning for worship. Let's stand together now. So we use these words from Revelation chapter 7 as God through his word calls us into his presence for worship. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Who else? 
Oh God, our Father, we join the angels and the archangels, all the company of heaven that are even now surrounding your throne of grace, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Your holiness is all-consuming and all-encompassing. And we confess that we as sinful creatures are unable to bear it. Yet you have made a way for us to stand in your presence this morning through the life, the death, the resurrection and ascension of our Savior Jesus Christ. And so we rejoice to sing and offer you our praises without fear of judgment. Accept the praise we bring, O Lord, and hear us now as we join our voices together praying the prayer our Savior taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death. Not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil, that he protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him.
Please be seated. Well, we are about to baptize two children here at our church, and if you're, if you're new to Christ the King, you may be wondering, why are we doing this? Why are we baptizing children? Well, in just a few weeks, baseball season is starting, okay? And when baseball season starts, some of you have children who haven't yet told you that they are Astros fans, but you know what you're going to do with those kids? you're going to put an Astro shirt on them, even though they haven't professed their fandom in the Houston Astros. The reason you do this is because we all like to dress our kids in the things that we love with the hope that one day they too will also love what we love. And in many ways, and really in a much deeper way, that's what's about to happen this morning. We are dressing these girls in the name of Christ His name is being placed upon them. And we don't believe that this saves them, but we also believe that God does something in this, just like even more so having the Astros jersey on as a child and growing to know them and growing to, over time is going to grow your love for them. In an even deeper way, we believe that dressing our kids in the name of Christ, putting his name upon them, that over time God works through this sacrament in a mysterious and beautiful and gracious way so that when they put their faith in him, he will welcome them into his family. So I have a few questions for you all and then questions for you congregation. Do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit, do you? Do you claim God's covenant promises in her behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation just as you do for your own? Do you? Do Do you now unreservedly commit your child to God and promise in a humble reliance upon God's grace that you will endeavor to set before her a godly example that you will pray with and for her? that you will teach her the truths of our holy faith and that you will strive using all the means which God has appointed to bring her up in the nurture and instruction of the Lord. Do you? Very good. Uh, Now, if I could have Stevie Lynn. This is Shannon Holland, by the way. She is assisting me because I need it. Shannon's our director of children's ministry. This is Stevie Lynn Dugan. Stevie Lynn, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stevie Lynn Dugan is little sister to Evie and to Sutton and to Kendall. And Stevie Lynn is quiet and a smiley baby. She probably has to be quiet sometimes. I bet there's a lot of noise at your house, a little bit. Um, Daughter, yeah, yeah, a lot. (laughs) She's daughter to Ryan and Michaela. And Stevie Lynn, um, the prayer, Ryan and Michaela's prayer for her comes from John 17, that she would know the only true God in Jesus Christ whom he sent. 
that she would be sanctified in the truth of his word and be sent out into the world to be a champion of the peace and salvation that Christ offers. May that be so, sweet Stevie Lynn. Here you go. She did great. Good job. She's got good coaching from her sisters. All right, Bree, y'all come on up. This is Charlotte Breed. Hi, Charlotte. <laughs> Mary Charlotte Breed, baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Charlotte is the daughter to David and Mallory Breed little sister to Adeline and John Mark. Charlotte is sweet and happy and talkative. You have anything to say? No? Okay, just check him. She's most entertained by her big brother and sister and will happily sing along with anyone who sings to her. The breed's prayer for Charlotte is that she would be a bright light for Jesus, knowing deeply the love of Christ and reflecting it boldly to others from 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And now, friends, let us say this blessing over these dear children as their church family. Stevie Lynn, Mary Charlotte, blessed children of the covenant, for you, God, made the world. For you, the prophets and patriarchs were sent. For you, the covenants and promises were given. For you, God's revelation was written down. For you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, became a man, lived a perfect life, died upon the cross, and was raised again for your salvation. You cannot possibly know the fullness of these things now, but we, your church, promise to tell them to you until you make them your own. Amen. You can be seated. Let's pray together. Oh God, our Father, we come to you professing and confessing that despite how we so often live our lives, we are not our own. You have created us. You sustain us. And you have redeemed us through the shed blood of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We approach your throne of grace today by his merit alone and through his intercession for us. So we pray that you hear our prayers and answer us according to your holy and perfect will. We pray for the Hispanic ministry of the PCA's mission to North America, that you would use that ministry to ignite a movement of PCA churches to reach Hispanics with the gospel. We pray specifically for the upcoming La Grande Comision conference that will be held this May here at Christ the King. We pray that you would use that conference as a catalyst to help m and reach its goal of two new Hispanic church plants in 2024 and 70 pastors and church planters in training by the end of 2025. We also pray for Alex Martinez as he settles into Houston and his new role at Christ the King. We pray for his upcoming transfer exams in Houston Metro Presbytery. We also pray that you would sustain him and his family as they are apart while their children finish their school year. Father, you are the giver of all good gifts, and we thank you for new life, because we confess that you knit us together in our mother's wombs, that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. To that end, we thank you for the birth of Murphy Jane, to Annalisa and Alex Pujol. We pray that you would bless this precious child, that by your grace you would never know a day that she does not worship and love you. All these things we ask in the name of Christ, our Savior, and our King. Amen.
Let's look to Jesus now and let's receive his mercy uh, through this time of confession of our sin. You may use the kneelers on the chairs that are in front of you if you'd like to do so. Take a moment to still our hearts and then let's pray this prayer together. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven. You say that the one who approaches you must approach you with clean hands and a pure heart. Our hands have done what is evil, and our hearts are stained by sin. Thank you for sending Jesus to be clean when we were dirty, pure when we were defiled. Forgive our sins and give us pure hearts that we may serve you rightly. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together now and hear these words of assurance. I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sin against me, and I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Thank you so much. Please do turn and greet those around you in the peace of Christ.
Well, good morning to you and welcome to Christ the King. You may be seated if you have not done so already. So good to be with you this morning for worship. My name is Clay Holland. If I have not met you yet, I am the pastor for family ministry here at Christ the King. Um, I'd love to meet you after the service, if you, especially if you're new uh, to our church. If you are new, welcome. We're glad that you're here. On the far left-hand side of any of the rows, there's a black pad. We would appreciate it if you'd take that pad, uh, record your attendance, pass it all the way down to the end of the row that you're sitting on. We'd love to know that you're here. We'd love for you to know who you are worshiping near, that you can greet them and make new relationships after our service. Just a couple of announcements this morning before our offering. The first is just a reminder to attend one of our focus groups. Uh, those are drawings to a, to a close here, uh, sooner rather than later. So if you haven't been to one of our focus groups, uh, you can find a list of those on our website. Those are for you to hear about uh, potential projects in our upcoming capital campaign and to offer feedback on those projects. It's a very important part of this process and we want to hear from everybody in that, so please do make a priority to attend. And also, as a reminder, Holy Week starts next week on Sunday with Palm Sunday, where we will also have our church picnic that afternoon. So plan to stay afterward and enjoy time of uh, food and fellowship with our church family on Palm Sunday. And then we have services on Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. You can find all of the times that are listed here uh, we will have some overflow set up on Easter Sunday, but as a reminder, uh, good seats. If you want to sit in the back, 8 o'clock, perfect for you. Um, 8 o'clock and 11 will probably be the least attended. 9.30 is generally the most, so just think about that uh, when you're making plans. Also, I would just encourage you to be at as many of those services as you can because uh, Easter Sunday is most meaningful. The resurrection of Jesus is most meaningful when we have walked uh, through the entirety of Jesus' last week on this earth. And so we have an opportunity to do that during Holy Week. Let me now pray uh, for our offering. Lord Jesus, uh, in thinking about Holy Week coming up and thinking about the death of our Savior and His glorious resurrection, we are reminded that we have all that we could possibly need in eternal life with You. We have hope. And Father, so many of our family members, our friends, our neighbors do not have that hope. And we pray, Father, that you would give us generous hearts to hold loosely to the things of this world that are passing away. That they may be used to present uh, a hope that does not pass away. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. times ten thousand in sparkling raiment bright the armies of the ransomed saints throng up the steeps of light tis finished all is finished their fight with death and sin fling open wide the gold What a rush of hallelujahs fills all the earth and sky. What a ringing of a thousand hearts bespeaks the triumph night. Thou prince. 
Thank you, Michaela, Katie, Joe. Welcome, everyone. My name is John Trapp, one of the pastors here at Christ the King. So glad to have you all joining us. Uh, I see some visitors here. I uh, just want you to know we've been going through the book of Revelation together and just some ground rules for you to help understand kind of where, how we're approaching this book, where we're coming from. Um, one of the things that we have said is that there's, there's a reason why there's a that the title of this book is given in the singular. It's not called Revelations, plural. It's Revelation, singular. It's really about one revelation to us. It's not a lot of future revelations. The book's not intended to be this kind of future predictor book that if you can kind of figure out all the different things that it's saying, you can understand all of these revelations about what's going to happen in world geopolitical history. It's about one revelation. That, that, that Greek word that we translate revelation is apocalypsis, which is, uh, it means the word to unveil. You can, you can hear the word apocalyptic in that. Um, it, it was a kind of, of genre of literature in the first century, apocalyptic literature, and, and this literature unveiled what was actually happening in the world by using commonplace images that people would understand. And so this book, Revelation, it's taking over and over commonplace images for people in the first century, particularly images from the Old Testament, which many of the first hearers would have been very familiar with because many of them had converted from Judaism to Christianity. So they they were familiar with the Old Testament. And you're going to see that again in this passage that we're about to read, that there's a lot of Old Testament imagery in this. And this Old Testament imagery is aimed at one singular revelation, And and the beginning of the book of Revelation tells us what this revelation is about. The first five words of this book, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This one singular revelation is all about Jesus. And that's what we say every week at Christ the King when we open God's word is that we, we believe that all of the scriptures from beginning to end, it's about our need for Jesus and God's provision of Jesus for people like us. So as we, um, as we gather around the word, I want that to, to be in your mind as we now look at Revelation 18. You can turn to page 1038 in the Black Bibles if you want to read along. I'm gonna read verses one through 14 of chapter 18 and then we'll skip over to verses six through 10, which uh, you just heard Joe, Katie, and Michaela just sing about. Revelation 18, 1 through 14 first. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory, and he called out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She's become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast, for all nations have drunk the wine of her passion of her sexual immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped as high as heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour 
your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore, cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots and slaves, that is human souls. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. Now look at verse 6 of chapter 19. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you have given us this word. And we pray that as we consider it now, you would help us, help us to see our great need for a savior and the great provision that you have made for one in Jesus Christ. And we ask this in his name, amen. So uh, the title of today's sermon is A Funeral and a Wedding. I hope that you kind of see that mapped out in Revelation 18, the funeral, Revelation 19, the wedding. Uh, I wanna begin by telling you, I I was with a, a group of friends, we were having dinner together, this was probably five or six years ago, and someone asked the question, what's an embarrassing moment that happened to you in middle school? And we kind of all began going around the table. There were lots of great stories that were told. But one of them stuck out to me. It was told by my friend. And he described what middle school was like for him first. He described um, being kind of a late bloomer. Uh, in eighth grade, a lot of his other friends had kind of shot up and were tall. He was, kind of, he was, he was a very little guy. Uh, he got teased about that some. And he also uh, described wanting to be with the popular kids, but never really being included, uh, having big crushes on on some of the the popular girls. There was one girl in particular he had this really big crush on, and uh, she was having a birthday party. It was going to be a dance, like a a boy-girl dance. It was a big deal. And and only, uh, not not everyone was being invited, only kind of the cool kids in the school were being invited. And then, uh, much to his joy, she invited him. She invited him and told him to come, come to this party. It's, uh, it, it, my parents have rented this place. So it's gonna be so fun. And it's gonna be this, we're gonna have this big pajama party and dance and have all this fun. And so my friend, little guy, wants to be in the cool club, picks out his pajamas, puts them on, and he shows up at the party and walks in and he's the only one wearing pajamas. I mean, it's kind of funny, but it's also devastating. I mean, really devastating. And he, he just broke down in tears. He ran out, didn't have a cell phone. This is pre-cell phone era, kids. Can you imagine? Find, finds a phone somewhere, calls his parents, come pick him up. And even as he was telling his story, this is now like a grown 40-year-old man, successful in, in business and everything that he's done, uh, married, kids. Even as he's telling this story to this day, like, while we're sitting around that table, he, he was tearing up, telling that story uh, about when he was in, invited to a party and told to dress in a certain way. And, and in dressing in that way, it actually ended up in his shame. And friends, this this revelation that is given to us about uh, about Babylon, which we heard last week from Clay, that this this Babylon that's that's depicted as this this prostitute, 
it is in, it's inviting people to dress for the end of times, for the day of the Lord. It's inviting, the, the, the city of Babylon, the prostitute Babylon is inviting people to dress and to prepare in a certain way, knowing that it will end in their shame. Babylon um, is presented in, in very different ways from how we've seen the beast presented earlier. The beast in the earlier chapters of Revelation is depicted as this creature that is trying to intimidate the people of God, to intimidate the people of God, to keep them from following the Lord. The prostitute of Babylon is also trying to get people to not follow the Lord, but she is doing it in a very different way. Rather than, tempting, rather than intimidating them, she tempts them. She tempts to lure them away from God. Verse three describes this. The nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. In the Old Testament, God presents himself as a spouse to his people. And over and over again, we see that the people of God in the Old Testament and then later in the New Testament turn from him, turn from him and begin worshiping idols. They turn from their, their lover, from their husband, the one who has, who has moved toward them in grace. They turn from him and worship other gods and commit adultery against him. And Babylon is depicted here as tempting people with sex, with luxury, with power, with self-aggrandizement. Tempting them in a way like, like spending time dressing up in your pajamas to show up for the party, being dressed in shame, knowing that it's going to end in your ruin. That is what Babylon is doing. And this is a warning. A warning is issued in, in verse four. You keep reading, it says, then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. This is a warning to the people of God that there is one who is coming for them to snare them, to lure them away. In Babylon, I said, as I said earlier, um, there's all kinds of Old Testament imagery in this passage and in all of Revelation. And Babylon was, was a city, a, a, a nation, that was opposed to the people of God in the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament. And even the, verse five um, of chapter 18 reminds us not only of the empire of Babylon, but the city of Babel all the way back in Genesis 11. Do you remember this city that decides to build this tower? They're gonna build this tower up into the heavens. Listen to how verse five describes Babylon. For her sins are heaped as high as heaven, God has remembered her iniquities. Do you remember what the people said in Genesis 11 when they decided to build that tower, what they were going to do? Verse four of Genesis 11, the people of Babel say this, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. You see, the people in Babel in Genesis 11, and now this picture of those who are opposed to God in Revelation 18, both of them are seeking to make their own identity. Let's make a name for ourselves, the people of Babel say. Do you see what the prostitute of Babylon says in verse seven? In her heart, she says, I sit as a queen. I am no widow and no mourning I shall ever see. She is creating her own identity, saying who she is. And friends, this is something that all of us are tempted to do. There is an allure into creating and to naming ourselves and who we are in our own identity. Now, I don't know if you saw um, one way this has, is manifested in our culture today. There was a Gallup poll published four days ago. Four days ago, about how many adults in our country now identify as LGBTQ. This poll revealed that 7.6 US adults currently now identify as LGBTQ. But even as you go down the generations, the, the numbers just rocket up higher. Millennials, that's uh, my generation, people born between 1981 and 1996, 9.8% identify. 
Gen Z, people born between 97 and 2012, this is the number that shocked so many people, including me. Gen Z, 22% identify as LGBTQ. Now, I'm just touching on this briefly. If you want to come up and talk to me after this, afterwards, happy to do that, okay? But because this is happening in our world, I feel like I need to talk about it, okay? Um, the lie of our world is saying this. If you experience attraction to someone who's the same sex as you, then that is your identity. Or you need to explore that and discover if that is your identity. Even if, you're, even if you only occasionally ex- experience attraction, then you need to in so- somehow embrace this as your identity. Some of you, some of you experience that attraction occasionally. Some of you experience that attraction very regularly. And what our world is saying is, no matter where you fit on that spectrum, if you experience some sort of attraction or some, some sort of, um, of attraction that falls in the LGBTQ spectrum, then you should embrace that as your identity. Friends, I, 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 I want to caution you that just because just because we may have a desire, that doesn't mean that that desire is something to build our life upon. Particularly a sinful desire. Now think about this, some of us, some of us are more stubborn than others. And you could say, I don't know, some of you, I, I mean, I've got five kids, I feel like sometimes it's nature and sometimes it's nurture that makes them stubborn. But some people just come out more stubborn than others. Some people have to become more stubborn because of the homes that they're in and you know, the dynamics of that household. They become more stubborn over time. But it is unwise to embrace stubbornness as your identity. But sometimes I, the Enneagram, okay, sometimes like someone will be, I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram. If, uh, people will use personality tests like that. I think that can be helpful, but sometimes you can use a personality test and be like, hey, you know what? I'm just an eight, which is a challenger, a stubborn person. I'm just an eight, and that's just who I am, and you've got to accept me for that. We'll, we'll use personality tests like that to, to kind of excuse our behavior and just say, this is my identity, this is who I am. But for someone who's embracing that identity, someone who's embracing stubbornness as their identity, they are, they're going to take losses. It's not good for them. It's gonna affect their work life. It's gonna affect their relational, relational life. It's gonna affect their entire life. And, and this is true for anything that we build our lives upon, anything that we try to make our identity. And, and it's, friends, it, it is true for making your identity based upon your sexuality. The U.S. Census Bureau, uh, in, a, in a recent uh, survey on mental health for people um, who identify as LGBTQ, this is a U.S. Census Bureau, by the way. It's not like a biased other kind of, this is pretty standard. Uh, they recently revealed that for uh, people within Gen Z, uh, within that generation, nearly twice as many LGBTQ individuals experience anxiety and depression than their non-LGBTQ counterparts. Now, there's likely a number of reasons for that. Um, my friends who would argue with me that, uh, that we should accept that way of life would, would likely say, well, it's because people haven't accepted them. That, that's why they're dealing with, with mental health and depression. And that's, in some ways, that's probably true. They, you, you are more likely to get bullied and it can be really hard in middle school and high school to have that kind of, um, that struggle. But is it really only because of lack of acceptance or could it also be, could it also be that we need something much more substantial to build our lives upon? That to embrace that identity and to move into that way of life, it can actually still leave you feeling really empty. It doesn't satisfy everything that you need and everything that you want. Every one of us, by the way, 
No matter our struggle, every one of us are tempted to build our identity on something. You want proof for that? Look at lifestyle brands. You know what a lifestyle brand is? Lifestyle brand is, um, it's something that, a lifestyle brand is like Yeti. I'm not taking shots at Yeti, okay? We have Yeti products at our house, okay? But yeah, it's like, a Yeti is, it keeps your drink cold. Why does it cost so much money? I'm go to Walmart and get some, you know, get the same kind of koozie that's gonna keep my drink cold for like a fourth of the price, but we get it because it's a lifestyle brand. It says something about our identity, about our image. And do you see how luxury is described here in Revelation 18? The lifestyle brand, the luxury, the luxurious life, it's, it's telling us that we will be, that we'll never mourn. That's what she says in, in verse seven. I'll never grieve. I'll never mourn. And this is what advertisements are selling us. You will be happy. You will be the ruler. In, in the TV show, Mad Men, Don Draper, who's a 1950s ad man, he says this. You know what happiness is? Happiness is the smell of a new car. It's freedom from fear. It's a billboard on the side of the road that screams reassurance that whatever you're doing, you're okay. This is what our lifestyle brands and our luxuries are are shouting to us. You will be okay. Embrace this. Take this. If If you'll have a luxurious life with lots of wealth and lots of things, then you will be free of fear. You'll be secure. A friend of mine was talking to his financial advisor. His financial advisor was kind of laying there, they're planning his life. His financial advisor was saying, hey, look, you get this insurance policy, get this much in your 401k, get this much money socked away, and based on your living expenses at that point, man, you're bulletproof. I'll think about that. That is so common to how we imagine and think about our wealth. That if we can accrue enough and get in a, in a certain place in life, then we will be safe. Then we will be bulletproof. That's what our luxuries are, are telling us. They're calling to us. They're alluring us. But Revelation and this vision in Revelation, it's unveiling what really happens to a world built on luxurious living to a life built on this, it all falls apart, it all dies away, and it happens very quickly. You see what's said in verses eight, verse 10, verse 17, verse 19? The plagues will come in a single day. In a single hour, your judgment has come. In a single hour, all this wealth has been laid to waste, verse 17. Verse 19, in a single hour, she has been laid waste. Single hour, by the way, it's the shortest amount of time in the entire book of Revelation. Can't find a shorter amount of time listed. You've noticed, we've seen years, we've seen months, we've seen time after times, but there's only, there's only one time where it talks about a single hour and when it's talking about what luxurious living really is like. It's like what the, the writer of Ecclesiastes says about his life. He says, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure for my heart found pleasure in all my toil and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expand, expended in doing it and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Friends, it is foolish. The scriptures are telling us, revealing to us, it is foolish to build our lives on something that won't last. Revelation is calling out to you and is challenging you and asking you, is that what you're doing? Are you building your life on your own identity, on your own wealth, on your own luxuries? If you've got the Black Bible still in front of you, flip over real quick to page 876. Jesus tells a story that warns us of this, of this same dynamic. In Luke 16, Jesus tells a story about a rich man and Lazarus. I'm gonna read a few of the verses, starting in 19. There was a rich man, Jesus said, who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. Sounds like, sounds like someone living in Babylon in Revelation 18, doesn't it? 
someone who has luxurious living, fine linen, feasting sumptuously. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. That's heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Now, this is very interesting. What do you think he's going to ask for? He gets Abraham's attention. This man is in torment. What does he ask for? Verse 24. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. Here's what's interesting about this story that Jesus is telling. Well, there's a lot of interesting things, but here, I'll give you one of them, okay? The rich man doesn't ask to leave. The rich man doesn't ask to be taken out of his place of torment. What the rich man asks for is another luxury. Give me a little bit of water. Give me, give me more of something that won't last. That's what he's asking for. It sounds, it sounds like the warning in Revelation 18, verse 14. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you. And all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. Here's the problem with longing for fruit. If you're longing for fruit, fruit comes and is plucked from a tree and fruit can spoil over time or you eat it and then it's gone. What we need is not just the fruit, we need the source of the fruit. What the rich man needed was not a drop of water, he needed the spring of everlasting life. We don't need the fruit, we don't need the luxury, we need the one who's at the center of it all, the source of it all. How do we get it? Well, here's another interesting thing about this parable that Jesus tells. Jesus, you may know this, Jesus tells lots of stories, lots of parables, all throughout books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke particularly. There's lots of characters in these stories that Jesus tells. But of all the stories that Jesus tells, only one of them has a name. Only one of those characters in all the parables that Jesus tells, only one of those characters gets a name, and it's the guy in this story who's named Lazarus. So if Jesus only does that one time, only one time he tells us the name of this guy, we should probably pay attention to the name that he chooses. And the name Lazarus literally means God is my help. You see, he has a different identity. Jesus identifies this man not as somebody who has figured it out, not as someone who has lived a perfect righteous life, not as someone who's never struggled, never sinned, never done anything wrong. This is a man whose identity is help me, God. God, be my help. Because friends, everything will pass away like the fruit that's plucked from a vine. And any other identity, security, or luxury will have a funeral. It will pass. But all of those things that we enjoy are actually signposts pointing us to the marriage that we all want. John depicts this final marriage supper in Revelation 19. But it's not the only time that John talks about a marriage supper in the Bible. In fact, the very first miracle that John records in the book of John happens at a marriage feast. Jesus is there with his disciples. Apparently Jesus had a friend who was getting married. We don't know who it was. And they're at the reception, and tragedy of tragedy, the wine runs out at the reception. And these receptions typically would go days long. They knew how to party in the first century. We can take some notes from them, all right? 
they run out of wine, which would have been to the shame of the bridegroom, the host of the party. And so Mary, being the good guest, knowing who her son is, goes up to Jesus and says, they've run out of wine. And Jesus very cryptically responds and says, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, if you continue reading the book of John, you'll see that over and over, there's mention of this hour. And the hour, all in the book of John, is the hour that Jesus goes to the cross. Now, the question is this, why in the world would Jesus bring up his death at a wedding feast where they've run out of wine. Because he knows what John, what John says, that this miracle is a sign. What do signs do? They point us in a direction. Jesus knows that this sign of this, of this wine problem at the wedding is a sign of all the problems in our world, which is that things run out. Things die, things decay, our bodies decay, people we love die. And it doesn't matter how you identify as someone who overcomes like this, this prostitute of Babylon says, I'm queen, I'll never be a widow, I'll never mourn, my life is gonna be great. It doesn't matter what you say about yourself, all of us are going to experience deep loss. And as Jesus hears about the loss of this wine at this party, he brings up the hour of his death because he knows that it's at the hour of his death that he will pay the price for the eternal party, for the ultimate wedding feast, the marriage supper that every single one of us longs for. That's, what, that's where our longings are. And Jesus in his grace, he is going to pay for our entrance into the party. Do you see what's said about these ones who are, who are shouting and singing hallelujah? Look at verse seven of chapter 19. The marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. How has she been ready? How has she been able to make herself ready? It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. How was she able to clothe herself? It had to be given. It was granted to her. Not because she had dressed herself up and been really good and been really awesome. Instead, it was given to her. You may be saying, well, hold up, preacher man. Look at verse eight. It says, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. That means people have done really good things to get in. No, it means that the saints get credit for righteousness that Jesus has done on their behalf because he paid for their admittance into the party. Paul draws this out in 1 Corinthians 6, verse nine. He's writing He's writing to Christians. I want you to remember this while I read this. He's writing to Christians, to people who are actively following Jesus. And he says this, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? There it is. You can't get in dressed the wrong way. You can't get in dressed in all of your unrighteousness. You can't show up to the party in your PJs. You're gonna be ashamed. Do not be deceived Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And now listen to the next verse. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the spirit of our God. Man, that's good news. Because what Paul is saying is that there are Christians in the church, there are Christians in the church in the first century who had been practicing homosexuality, who had been idolaters, who had been drunkards, who had been greedy, who had no business getting in. 
And yet, they were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. So my question for you, who's dressing you? Where is your identity? Is God your help? Have you admitted to him that you can't make your own identity? You can't get in on your own. You are desperately in need of help. Do you know what? God always gives help to those who ask. You come to him in faith and repentance and just ask him for help. It's what he welcomes us to do. And that's what I want to close by saying this. This does mean that this, this is, there's a high cost for following Jesus, um, for having our identity in him. I mean, I, I have people who I deeply love who because they are following Jesus and because they don't um, desire um, an intimate relationship with someone of the opposite sex, it means that they're gonna live a celibate single life for the rest of their life, unless God changes their desires, which he can do. But that's a high cost. It also means that in a church, in a country where most of the people who are following Jesus are women statistically, it means that there are women who long to be married who long to have children, who are going to follow God's word for them, to, to only marry somebody who is a Christian. And that is a, that is a high cost. That is a very high cost. But friends, the vision that's being held out to us is that there is something that is so much better coming that all of our desires for intimacy, for union, they're all just a whisper of what one day we will fully know in Christ. And G Jesus tells us in Matthew 19, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. And, and this, I'll close with this. This makes me think of um, C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. And there's this beautiful scene in The Great Divorce where, um, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with, it's kind of a trippy book, okay? But if you're not familiar with the book, there's a guy who's um, taken from hell and given a tour of heaven, okay? Like I said, tri trippy book. So he, um, he has shown a, a picture of uh, he's, he's shown a person and he sees this woman and there's this parade of people who are all around her and they're celebrating and there are all these kids around her. He, he, his first guess is that it's Mary. Is it, is it, I whispered to my guide, not at all, said he. Someone you'll never heard, have heard of. Her name on earth was Sarah Smith and she lived at Golders Green. She seems to be, well, a person of particular importance. Yes, she is one of the great ones. You've heard that fame in this country and fame on earth are two quite different things. And who are all these young men and women on each side? This is a woman who was single her whole life. They are her sons and daughters. She must have had a very large family, sir. Every young man or boy that met her became her son. Even if it was only the boy that brought the meat to the, her back door. Every girl that met her was her daughter. The last will be first, the first will be last. Where is your identity? Who is your help? Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for your word and for your grace. We pray that you would um, root us in it and we ask um, that you would help us to press on until the day that we see you face to face in Christ's name, amen.
Friends, this meal is a taste of the feast that is to come. If you haven't yet put your faith in the Lord Jesus, first off, I just want you to know we're really glad you're here. Um, We don't want you to feel like you've got to fake being a Christian here. Uh, That means that uh, this meal is one that we would invite you to abstain from. You can do that either by remaining seated or if you'd like, you can come forward with your arms crossed so that we know simply to pray a blessing over you. We're really glad that you're here. Um, If you are a Christian, whether you're a member of Christ the King Presbyterian Church or any other church that proclaims the good news of Jesus, this isn't just our church's table. This is Jesus's table. You're welcome to come and join us for this foretaste of the feast that is to come. So let's celebrate this meal together now. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. Let's pray. Father, it is right and good to give you thanks and praise. Please nourish us with this meal we ask now by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. The night that he was betrayed after giving thanks, our Lord Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he also took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant which is poured out in my blood for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. O Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. O Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. O Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. The gifts of God are for the people of God, so come and feel them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. gift of praise is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope.
Please stand. Now let's lift up our hands, our heads, and hearts and receive this blessing. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. May the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you. Thanks be to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son.